attention to the Word of God in the book of Colossians, and we'll read it and pray and go into teaching it. Thank you, good sir. Hello, everyone. We will uh, turn with me to um, Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 15 to 17. Colossians 3, 15 to 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's word to us this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you uh, for your goodness to us. Thank you for uh, the scripture to us this morning. Uh, we pray that as Daniel uh, comes to us and uh, preaches your word to us, pray that you would help him and give him your words to say. I pray that um, your words would dwell in us richly. Please um, enrich our souls through, through what we hear. Please magnify yourself to us and make yourself great in our eyes. Uh, so, and, and in doing so, please increase our knowledge of you and our love for you and our love for each other. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And look at this passage together uh, in Colossians 3 here. So, a question I had as I was reading this was, what is it that really makes a Christian community compelling? Compelling, driving, encouraging, uh, contagious. What is it that makes a Christian community compelling? We looked at last week how the Christian community, it, second to oneself, is the most important reality besides your relation to Christ, but it's also the most difficult. So my faux title of last week's sermon was, uh, how do you deal with or thrive in the most annoying group of people on earth or the most difficult or submit whatever experience you've had with the church? Uh, but this morning, we look at this passage, and he continues focusing on the community of Christ, looking at what actually makes it compelling. So interestingly and helpfully, there's a book written years ago, uh, Mark Dever, and it's called The Compelling Church. No, no, no. Oh, I already messed it up. The Compelling Community. Oh, gosh. Now I need to look again. The Compelling Community. Compelling Community. Um, and in it, he uh, looks at this idea of what it is that makes a Christian community actually compelling or engaging. And so he looks at um, this idea or this instance of someone attending a church. And what do they see and what do they find? And whether or not make, it makes that compelling. So he says this, let's say a single mother joins his church. Uh, what normally happens, he asks at that point. Single mother walks in, wants to get involved. So he says this, uh, who's she first going to naturally build friendships with? Uh, other single moms, probably. So I encourage her to join a small group for single moms, and sure enough, she quickly integrates into the community and actually begins to thrive. So we've done it, he said. We've done it. We've connected a sheep into the fold. At mission accomplished. And he says, well, hold up. Maybe. Maybe. And this is why. Because what just occurred could be a demographic phenomenon and not necessarily a gospel phenomenon. And he explains it like this. Single moms for instance, gravitate towards each other whether or not the gospel is true. So you go to a mom's group in the community and they're gathering. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a gospel-centered or gospel-compelling community. And so he says, uh, he points out how oftentimes the tools that churches can use to build community 
can sometimes accidentally, or maybe intentionally in not good circumstances, play to this demographic connection. Similar life experiences, he lists, singles groups, newly married Bible studies, young professional networks. Similar identity, maybe you've heard of cowboy churches, motorcycle churches, arts churches. Uh, Maybe a similar cause, ministry teams for feeding the hungry, elementary school uh, age, combating human trafficking. Similar needs, life stages, similar social position, even like in New York churches that gather the movers and the shakers. Uh, So he says in this, he, he pauses because he has just critiqued his entire church as well in the doing of this. But he says this, my goal is not to make people feel guilty for having natural connections, even though some of those would exist outside of the gospel if it weren't true. My goal is not, as well, he says, that you have nothing in common with anyone at church as a measure of your connection. But his goal is this, in building a a compelling community to adjust our aspiration, to aim for something higher than just social connection and cohesion based on affinity. We can have that. He has that. He likes that. But there's a danger of laying it there and leaving it there and not going beyond. And if we don't have that beyondness of the gospel, we will be like every other connectional um, affinity group outside in the world. Our church won't be distinct. The church, like the church of Christ, will not be distinct and therefore compelling to a world that can already get social groups outside on its own. What is it that makes this group unique? What is it that makes a church unique and compelling to an outside world? And he talks about how a church centered on and enriched with Christ does that. And interestingly, our passage does that as well. If you want to know what makes a group of people uniquely Christian, this passage actually in a, it's like a a preacher's home run because it, it lays out these three ways that Christ dwells uniquely in this group of people in a way that it doesn't in the world and creates this compelling, attractive community that reflects God himself, which is what we want. So we're going to look through this and we're going to take this in turn, looking at this compelling community here in the book of Colossians. So look with me first here. The first aspect that really sets apart this group of people from any other social group in the world is this. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. So here's the first of three of Christ's. Let the peace of Christ rule. Let the peace of Christ rule. So the peace of Christ, you know, when you hear that phrase, sometimes you can think of like this calm inner state, and sometimes that is how it's used in Scripture. So I'm not knocking that. Uh, when Jesus is leaving and says, my peace I give to you, don't be anxious. He's talking about peace in that calm sense. But here, given the context of even the rest of this verse, he's talking about a different kind of peace ruling in our hearts. Look at the end of this verse here. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. So what he's aiming for and angling at is a oneness kind of peace, a lack of divisions. Uh, And even our passage last week, right above this, talks about that. If one of you has a complaint against the other, forgiving fully and quickly. So here, this peace of Christ is the peace that Christ brings between believers. Now, there can actually be Many kinds of peace. We have this funny kids book uh, at our house. It's actually not funny, but it's interesting. It talks about, it's called the quiet book. 
And it's cute. It's a board book, and it has all of these different kinds of quiet. So it has, uh, like, peanut butter jelly fell on the floor kind of quiet. And you have this picture of a kid where he's, like, looking up, and there's that moment of silence when he realizes that he's going to get in trouble for dropping this, or he made a mistake. Then there's, like, the swimming underwater quiet where he's, like, there's some silence because he's in the pool, he's underwater. Then there's this... uh, Best friends don't need to talk quiet because he's just hanging out with his friend by the river. Well, so there's different kinds of quiet. There's actually different kinds of peace, and only one of them sets apart this community. There are other kinds of peace in other kinds of communities, but they are different from this kind of peace. And the kind of peace that you can see in other communities is probably best displayed in like a, a Thanksgiving family reunion or gathering, or maybe for you it's Christmas or maybe for you it's a funeral when you see people, or a wedding. Um, There are different kinds of peace that can bring a group together. I know, I just went to a wedding, and I saw different kinds of peace at work here, what I I thought. I'm not going to impute motives to anyone. There is the peace of avoidance. You just avoid the people you don't like and talk to the people you do. That is a very useful and helpful kind of peace in the world. But it is not the peace here that Paul is talking about. Another kind of peace you could call the peace of appearance. So I will, I know what to talk to you about, and I know what not to talk to you about, and I keep it surface level, and therefore we can be in the same room and smile and have peace. This is indeed how most family reunions go. The peace of appearance. Until you know someone with no filter just kind of goes out and says it and destroys the peace, and then the arguments begin again. It's that kind of superficial peace here. But here, Paul is talking about a very different kind of peace. Not the peace of avoidance, not the peace of appearance, but the peace of of Christ. It is specifically Christian peace. And we've talked here about, and Colossians, Paul has talked about that kind of peace. It comes first from a peace with God, this Romans 5. Therefore, we have peace with God. We've been reconciled. Anything standing in between us and God has been dealt with and removed by Christ. Therefore, as one scholar says, it is inconceivable that those who share with one another the benefits of the peacemaking work of the cross should live with any hatred or contempt for each other in their hearts. So this is this peace of Christ that removes obstacles here between believers. This is the peace of Christ that makes this community compelling, different. And the, the description or the action that this one is given is letting it rule in your hearts. So this is a neat word or picture. Uh, People have compared it to an arbitrator or a judge ruling, even an umpire. So you think of, you can uh, almost outside of this community, you can see this umpire. And the one who is calling the shots, who is determining uh, the relationships between these, is not our... Selves. It is not avoidance. It is not appearance. It is the peace of Christ is the arbitrator. Arbitrator. It is the umpire between Christians. So this is uh, soccer season. Start, soccer is starting back up. It's one of the most cute but infuriating things because you could do something better probably and you're watching them do it, but they're going at it. And sometimes, though, they lose sight that they are on the same team and they will start trying to take the ball from each other. And it, it happens a lot, apparently. And in that moment, something rises up within you to say, and we actually do say this, same team, same team. Here in this, Paul, in this passage, Paul is saying this, that the peace of Christ now yells in us, not same team per se, but same body, same body, same body, same body. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you are indeed called in one body. What he's saying is the whole purpose Christ died 
was to bring you together in one body. So let that peace rule. Let that be the determiner, not your past relationships, not your past sins, not the other person's past sins. What makes the, the Christian community unique and compelling and different is the ruling of Christ in one body. This past week, I learned more about uh, the phrase, the pound of flesh. They want their pound of flesh. It's from Shakespeare. Who knew? That's why I was forced to read Shakespeare growing up. Uh, Pound of flesh. In this uh, play, The Merchant of Venice, there is this, uh, there's these two guys. And one is a, one is one of the main characters. The other is a money lender. And they do not like each other. They are at odds. They've always fought each other. And the main character, Antonio, needs uh, some money, and he's in a tight situation, and he goes in his need to Shylock, who is this money lender. And Shylock says, why would I lend money to you? Now, he says it in a much more Elizabethan, beautiful way. Uh, why would I lend money to you? I hate you. You hate me. Uh, and he says, well, I need it. I need it really bad, and that's the only reason I'm willing to go to you. And so in this moment, uh, Shylock says this. I have a happy plan. I have, I have an idea for us. If you can't pay back what you owe, what, I, what you're, I'm going to give you, how about I take from you a pound of flesh? And in his need, he says, sure. His confidence that he'll be able to pay it back. Sure, sure, whatever you want. Let me just have this money and go. Uh, something ends up happening where his money gets tied up and it comes time to pay. And Shylock says, give me my money. And Antonio says, I don't have it yet. Uh, and he says, all right, when well, it's time for your pound of flesh. And his friend's standing by, Antonio's friend says, I'll pay you. And he says, no, I, I want my pound of flesh. And his friend says, I'll pay you three times what he owes you. You have the money, you have three times of it. And Shylock says, I want my pound of flesh. Nothing but the law. I want my pound of flesh. In this passage, what makes this community different is what Shylock could never do, is not only not take his pound of flesh, but the peace of Christ is one that not only takes, but, or refuses to take, but gives a pound of flesh for the other, lays his life down for his friend. It's such a contrast here, and it makes the com community of Christians compelling. We can actually say, I'm not going to hold you to your sin that you did last week to me. I'm actually going to serve you. You are supposed to give me a mile. I'm now going to go with you two miles. That kind of love and peace ruling in this community is what makes it Compelling. So that's the first aspect here of this compelling community. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The second is this. Let the word of Christ dwell. If the first is let the peace of Christ rule, the second is let the word of Christ dwell, indwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing, singing, here, in this passage, what marks the Christian community is not just their peace, their Christ-filled peace, but the word of Christ itself makes this unique. Now, this is interesting. When you study this passage, when you study the New Testament, the Bible, what indwells people is often the Spirit of God or God himself. So Paul elsewhere says... We, people, are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Who indwells people? God does. Paul says in Romans 8, if Christ is in you, uh, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, so here in this one passage, we've seen God the Father indwelling, we've seen Christ the Son indwelling, and now we've seen the Spirit of God indwelling. But here in Paul, in Colossians, we see the Word is actually the one indwelling. And so as one 
uh, wise teacher said, in Paul's teaching, there's never any question of word and spirit being separately experienced. The coming of the word of God is the coming of the spirit. And the coming of the spirit is the coming of the living and abiding word of God. Therefore, to enjoy the fullness of the spirit, a Christian must be filled with the word of God. And it actually takes form. So thankfully, have you ever been somewhere or to someone's house and you've had an incredible meal? What's the first thing you ask for or do at the end of that meal? Or maybe at the beginning, after you taste it. You're like, I've got to have the recipe for this. Please share. I could try, through trial and error, to figure out which pasta, which sauce, which spices, which meat, how to make it, how long to bake it. I can wing it, I can try it, but I want to know. I want this meal. How can I have this meal? And thankfully, Paul gives us the recipe. And he lists these three ways, these three aspects. The first is a part of teaching. So here he says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How, Paul? Teaching. So the, one of the ways that Paul here says the Christian community is different and compelling is that the word of Christ is taught. Uh, second here, he lists another word, and I want to help distinguish the two. The second one he gives is this, teaching and admonishing. So when you look at those put together, they have, have kind of different nuances here. The teaching being kind of positive and the admonishing being a bringing back from negative. So here, part of the way that the church is different is that there is a teaching and admonishing. But note who it's from. Paul has said already in this passage and in the New Testament that teachers and preachers are given... But here, he's shifting to the community, and he says what makes the community different and compelling than the world's communities is that the word of God dwells through the teaching and admonishing of one another. The teaching and admonishing of one another. Think about this. How many times, again, this is, I'm channeling Mark Dever's opening here. Uh, when you get together with a group of Christians, how much actually one anothering of the word and, heaven forbid, correcting or challenging lovingly with the word happens? How much of that actually happens? Like, when the pastor gets invited somewhere, you expect it and you kind of hope he doesn't bring it up. But when you're with each other, how much is the word of what you're sharing and learning or what, where you're being challenged, how much of that is brought out here? Here, what makes this compelling is the word of Christ dwelling richly within the people. And then he says this, singing. So this is surprising. It makes sense that you would teach the word and admonish with the word, but then the intellectual man himself says singing. And this is cool. Look at this. Singing psalms. So there's three kind of ings in this passage. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. How? Teaching, admonishing, singing. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. These are actual titles from Old Testament psalms. What he's saying is this. The way the word of Christ dwells in you is through these Old Testament psalms or songs or hymns. What he's doing there, if you see it, is this. He is equating in his mind the Old Testament Psalms as the word of Christ. This is not just the word of Israel. This is not just the word of the Old Testament. This is the word of not just God the Father, but the word of Christ himself. And the way that it dwells in his people is through singing it, is through going to it and even teaching from it. And so this teaching and admonishing um, oftentimes one of the most referenced passages of the Old Testament for the divinity of Christ is the Psalms. Psalm 110 being one of the main ones. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the Psalms are actually the source for this community of their teaching, of their admonishing, and of their singing. This word dwelling is is how it begins to dwell richly 
and its people. It's not limited to Sunday mornings. It's not limited to small groups. It is built into every person in this church, singing, teaching, admonishing one another. Uh, Dever, in his book, asks the question, what about churches that want to plant? What advice do I have for churches that want to plant a new church from them? And he asks, he, he lists out this series of questions for churches and pastors to assess the readiness of their church to plant another church. And listen to the questions that he lists for people who are wanting to plant a church. Is your congregation clear on the gospel? If you were to ask random members of your congregation uh, what the good news of the cross is, how would they answer? Uh, There's no reason why a congregation full of new believers shouldn't be able to do this well. But in many of our churches, we're not there yet. His second question, is your congregation telling others the gospel? Church planning is the natural result of evangelism, and it won't work well without it. Question three, do your church members, he's asking this pastor, do your church members teach God's word to each other? Now, this book was not written for this sermon or for this passage, but here, I mean, it lines up so naturally. Do your church members teach God's word to each other? Is yours a church culture where it's normal to encourage each other with scripture? Question four, does your congregation take their responsibility seriously to guard each other from sin? Are those conversations both honest and grace-exalting? Is that the DNA of of, of your congregation? Question five, I like this one. Is most of the pastoring in your church done by the congregation? Is it unusual for a pastoral problem to come to your attention as the pastor where there are not already ordinary members at work? Are you the only one to hear about pastoral problems, or is the church naturally engaged in helping, even if they want help or assistance from the pastors? That's five. Six is this. Do you already see a breadth and depth of relationships that cannot be explained by natural bonds alone? Have these types of relationships come to characterize your congregation? We get a congregation that has all single moms, all young adults, all young professionals, all empty nesters, whatever. You pick your stage. That can happen outside of the community of Christ. It doesn't need Christ to do it. It doesn't mean it's wrong when it's in. So he says this to this pastor who's asking about planting. If your congregation can't answer yes or mostly to these questions, I fear your church's DNA is not yet worth replicating. You still may be involved in the Great Commission. Uh, You still may even raise up church planners to do good work elsewhere. But as a congregation, you will need to mature further before your community is ready to birth a new congregation. And what's incredible about this passage is that these questions come from, they mate perfectly, they match with these three verses here in Colossians. Letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts so that your relationships are not only built on affinity, but Christ. Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, the thankfulness in your hearts to God. The question is naturally, where are we? Where where are we in this assessment? I'll leave that for your conscience and for your sustained time with the Holy Spirit this afternoon. Lastly, he says this, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, do everything Peace of Christ ruling, word of God dwelling, the word of Christ dwelling here, the name of Christ informing. There's actually not as much content in this one. It's a one-off phrase. Let everything you do. It's like, do you do it? Then do it in the name of God. And that's what marks 
a compelling Christian community here. In the Old Testament, any time this phrase was used, it was used with this consciousness of the sovereign presence of God. So when prophets would speak, they would say, in the name of the Lord. Uh, here in, the Psalm, in Psalm 20, for instance, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Uh, in the book of Nehemiah, I confronted them and made them take an oath in the name of God. David and Goliath. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Uh, it is this deep recognition of the presence and sovereignty and authority of God. A group of people that supernaturally recognize in their lives the presence and sovereignty and authority of God over them will be a compelling community. Whatever they do, they do it knowing that it's God who they're pleasing. They do it in the power that God provides. They speak with the words that God provides. They are God-soaked. And so one pastor says it this way. They do everything according to his command, in compliance with his authority, by the strength derived from him, with an eye to his glory, and depending on his merit for the acceptance of what is good in them, and depending on his merit for the pardon of what is bad in them. Everything is in the name of Christ, in the person, the presence of Christ. Where do we begin? I want to leave you with something here. I don't know if you've seen it. Hopefully you weren't like, hey, he's skipping that in this passage. In each of these three areas of a compelling community, the, the peace of Christ ruling, the word of Christ dwelling, the name of Christ informing, each of these ends with thanksgiving. 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you're wondering where to begin or how to go one step closer to this from wherever you are, start with thankfulness. Because all of this in this community is a gift. And what do you do when you receive a good gift? You give thanks. It, it spontaneously comes out of you that you're thankful that you have peace with God and can ha actually have peace with others, that you would be indwelled by the Spirit of Christ himself with his word, and it overflows with thankfulness, that you would be allowed to put the Father's name on you, the Son's name, the Spirit's name upon you, a sinner, that he would dwell with you and that you could live under his household in every way, it leads to thankfulness. So if you're looking for a way to enjoy and engage and move forward in the Lord in this, I would say this, give thanks. We don't force these ways upon us. We look to the Lord to produce this in us. It's his work, and we give him thanks. So I'm going to lead us in prayer and then a song of thanksgiving after this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that you have given us your word. Thank you that you've given us your peace. Thank you that you've given us your name. Lord Jesus, I pray and ask for this community that you would give us hearts that recognize you and that praise you genuinely from the heart. Lord, help us even in this next song to let our hearts be tuned to sing your praise, that it would pour out of us and as we do, that you would make us as compelling as you are. Father, Son, and Spirit, show yourself in this community. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing this song of thanks together.